Well, looks like our people, they're going to have to, a lot less water use right here, right? They're all left here, so we're not going to have as much. But I, I was really wanting to, I, a very interesting discussion, I thought earlier, and I wasn't going to do this demonstration because it takes a little bit, and, you know, and I figure, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, but I think it's really germane to what we were talking about because I heard a lot of discussion about water and how we need to, you know, we need more water to put on our crops and we need, you know, reservoirs, and which I have no problem with, but I heard very little discussion and no discussion about the basic resource that we're going to be applying that water to, which is the soil. And my whole point is we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about ways that we can improve the soil so we may be able to minimize the requirement of water usage that we have. And the other point, I think it's interesting, I need a couple of volunteers here, so I'm going to pick on uh, this gentleman right here. Yeah, you, yeah, 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 you. And, and grab the guy next to you, too, since you're sitting there right there. This, this is a, yeah, plus it's kind of late in the day in the end, and, you know, people have been a lot of information, a lot of bar graphs and charts and that kind of stuff. So all I do, we, I work for NRCS, and I, I'm an old guy. I've actually got 38 years of experience. Now, normally what I do is I ask the crowd how many people are that old, and the crowd I talk to, most of them are not that old, so I, it makes me feel good anyway. But I want you guys to come up here, and what I want to do is we go around the country talking about soil health and how soils function, and, and it really is amazing to me how little farmers know about how soils, what they are, and how they're supposed to function. And this is two simple demonstrations we do. So what's your name? Your Bill? Okay, Bill, I'm going to give you that clod, and you're Robert. Okay, now what, what I do, kind of hold those up, and what I do is ask these, these soils, now you, yeah, kind of hold it up, maybe the camera take a look at it. Now, what, these soils, if you were to go to a, a USDA soil survey, everybody know what that is? Yeah, okay, everybody should raise their hand on that one. Okay, that, that, these are mapped the same. It's a, it's a Clifton fine sandy loam soil. Which that means it was formed in the same way, the same five soil forming processes formed this soil, and that's all. Now, do those look like the same soils to you? These are from the Piedmont region in North Carolina. You all got Piedmont soils here? Okay, I figured you did. You, those are from, do those look like the same soils? Okay, what's the main difference between the two? Yeah, color. One's red and one's darker brown. So what's color an indicator of? Organic matter. So darker color soils tend to have higher organic matter levels. So what we want to do is these have been air dried, which means they've been sitting on my desk for about a week or two. All the moisture sucked out of it or air evaporated out of it. All these, uh, the only difference between these two soils is not how they were formed, but in the decisions that the farmer made, the farmer decisions. This farm here, this red soil, looks like it's clawed. This one's got a few holes in it. You've got a piece of vegetation there. This one looks massive structure, kind of crunched together, doesn't it? Is this came from a vegetable farm that had a lot of disturbance, a lot of tillage, uh, had a lot of uh, excessive applications of herbicides and pesticides, and it was kind of a lot of synthetic material. Well, this farm, this soil here, guy's been practicing the soil health principles I'll talk about. Been no-tilled for 30 years, has not seen any synthetic fertilizers in this millennium. That's, we're going into year 14, 14 cropping seasons in this millennium. He manages it with cover crops, no-till, and manures, okay? He raises silage. So what I want you to do is to drop these in here and just kind of see what happens here. So the water is air-dried. Now, what did you do there? Did you get that little extra oomph when you threw that in there? Now, wait, now, wait a minute. What, now, what, what's happening here? Again, it's important to understand how soils function before we can solve these water issues that you talk about. What's happening as the water infiltrates this one. Look, we've got some air bubbles coming out here, don't we? See that air bubble right there? I like to have my, my I didn't want to just say that. You guys can validate to see the air bubble. What's going on is the water is going in these pore spaces, and the strength of the water exceeds the strength of the soil here. So it's falling apart. It slakes. Whereas this one, this one's a lot of disturbance, minimal disturbance. The water is soaking in, same amount of pore. Well, actually, it has more pore space. has bigger pore space. But what's going on, this is biologically dead. This soil is biologically alive. And the biotic glues that are made from the bacteria and the fungi and all these things, these microorganisms that we previously thought were negative to the soil are binding and holding this soil together. Okay, now think about that. You say, that's kind of neat. So what's going to happen? This is going to fall apart by the end of my presentation, and this thing will hold together till tomorrow or till the next day. And you go in there and you break it apart. It'll be moist, 
in a, but it still have that aggregation that's being formed and held together by the microbes in the soil. Okay, that, that's a pretty neat demonstration, but you think of big whoop, okay? Right, that's right, Steve, big whoop. Okay, well, we'll show you what big whoop is. Now, the next, next part of my demo here, I want you to just take this. These are the same soils, and all I've done is pour them in this, this uh, thing. These got holes in the bottom. You want to verify the holes? Yeah, there's holes in the bottom, okay? And all I do is just take this spoon, kind of tap around the edge, kind of seal it off a little bit so it doesn't leak around the edge there. And I want you to do is make it rain. So just pour those on, on there. So, but, but before you do this, i got a question. I'm from Indiana, and we were taught in Indiana what you do with soil is you till the soil. One of the benefits of tillage is you fluff it up so it absorbs more water, right? Now, yeah, they teach that here at Auburn, Steve? Okay, but that might have been the class you skipped, right? Anyway, they teach that. All right, so we till soil to fluff it up so it absorbs more water. Okay, that's a universal application of tillage. Okay, so this one's tilled. This is from the no-till, uh, healthy soil, poor soil. So just pour the water on there. Let's see what happens. God, I hope this works. We're kind of simulating the rainfall there. Okay, yeah, it's going to be, okay, well, wait a minute. That one's leaking through pretty fast. Now, why is that? Why is the water going through the, the no-till? No, and the other thing is, how come it's ponding on top of this? Think about it. I thought if we fluff soils, tilt it up, it's supposed to soak through, right? It's not soaking through very fast, is it? What's going to happen to all this water here? We're talking about water. We're talking about crop production. We're talking about building reservoirs, weren't we? We're talking about runoff. Do you want this is what's going to go fill your reservoir up, isn't it? So that means tillage is good because it's going to seal off all that landscape. Is that what we want? No, that's not what we want. What we want is that water to soak in through the soil. Why is that soaking in there? It's got pores. It's got macro pores. It's got micro pores. It's got what? It's got organic matter. Organic matter. What's organic matter, do besides give color? Gives a structure. Okay, what else it do? What, so you got water, we want it to soak through and not run off. And while it's soaking through down in that soil profile, we want it to hold on to some of it, right? So when you get to that June, July, and August that you all are worried about getting dry, we want it to be able to give it back. Did you know that every pound of organic matter can hold up to two gallons of water? You think about that. Think about it. every 1% organic matter in your soil increase gives you about 14,000 gallons of available moisture during the growing season. Now, what's that mean to an irrigation system? An extra two, three, four days between irrigation events. You know, so we talk about mitigating and improving things for, for crop production. We need to have this discussion about soil, okay? So this will eventually soak through. But again, when it runs off, it's also going to take nutrients and all those other things. So, okay. Well, let's give my two helpers a hand here. So, see if I can get this thing woke up here. There we go. There we go. All right. All right. Now, I wasn't going to do that, but I think it's really important because as you all have these discussions about soil or about building reservoirs and water, don't exclude the insignificance. Boy, this is going to be hard to talk to this group. You're going to have to go here and there. Nobody in the middle. Anyway. Let's start, like, how many of us have had some kind of a basic soil class? Okay, so we all knew we went to soil, especially when our CS people were supposed to have, what, 52 hours or something, Steve? We're supposed to have a lot of soil. We all learned that soil is made up of chemical, physical, and biological components, right? That, that, that's nothing new. And the problem is, I went, when I took soils back way a long time ago, back in Indiana, and I didn't go to the P school, I went to another school, uh, but anyway... We learned that, but I checked, I checked. When I left the office, I was a student trainee, I worked for NRCS or SCS at the time, I left biology at the door. And all we tended to focus on was the physical and the chemical, because that's something we understood. We could run a soil test, right? And we get the chemical analysis. We know the P, the K, the micronutrients, all that good stuff, cation exchange capacity. You know, the physical part, we can beat the hell out of that with our tillage equipment, all right? So we know that, we're trying to build structure through tillage which I spent a, a long time of my life. But the biology, that was a little mysterious, a little un, unknown. So we kind of left that at the door, all right? And then we also knew that the, uh, the ideal soil is what made up of 50% uh, solids and 50% airspace. And that airspace is supposed to be there for moisture and for air, right? 
And we tend to, I'm from the Midwest, and we pretended to, to focus more on the, the moisture part because that what's inhibited crop growth because our roots couldn't penetrate, okay? But actually, they're supposed to be a, a, a flux. You know, you got more air, moisture, that type of thing. And then the minerals, we got sand, silt, and clays make up 45% of it or so in the ideal soil. And then we got 5% organic matter. Now, how many of you farmers out there got 5% organic matter? Really? Wait a minute. Did I see a hand over there? That's really... That's impressive. I moved to Georgia from Indiana. Jimmy Dean was a state agronomist there, and he showed me a soil health card, and he had a, I think he got a high rating if he had 1% above 1% organic matter. I said, Jimmy, is this a typo or what? You know, of course, I'm from Indiana. We, we, we got 3% up there. But the point is, most of our organic matter we've lost. You know, we talk about the loss of topsoil out there, but really we've lost over 50%. 50%, folks, of the organic matter in our soils since we started to crop them intensively has been lost. Where's that gone? CO2 into the atmosphere. All right. So we go around, we talk about soil health. That's driving our agency right now. It's fun to be in something like this because it's new. It's, not, it's innovative, it's fun, it's exciting, and it's not programs. Okay? I'm not up here to give you $10 an acre for doing this. I'm up here to help you understand how soils function. And this is a definition we need to use. It's the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem. And you think about that. The continued capacity. We're talking about something not two years down the road, not 100 years down the road, but a sustainable system for four or 500 years. We need to do that, okay? Because the, the units, the materials we use we, are, are in short supply. You know, we get nitrogen out of the atmosphere. We mine phosphorus. Those are not... In, uh, boundless materials, okay, infinite supplies is what I mean. The idea of soil is a vital living ecosystem. How many of you farmers have gone out on your farm and looked at their feet and realized what's going on below your feet? The fact that there is more life below your feet than there is in the planet. It's, it's just a tremendously intricate deli or, uh, system down there that you need to really understand. And the idea of soil to function. Now, what do we need our soils to do? You put that seed in the ground. We heard about wheat. We heard about corn. We heard about production. But what is it that seed needs from, those, from the soil to grow, to produce these food and fiber? What do we need from our soil? What are those soil functions necessary for that? Come on. Nutrients. nutrients. Our first one, nutrient cycle. We need to get nutrients from the soil. Do you realize that more than you put on? How many of you fertilize your field? All right. Come on, farmers. You realize less than 50% of that fertilizer you put on the field ends up into the plant? Think about that. That's not a very efficient system, is it? Well, how's it done? It gets mitigated, but it goes through the microbes. It goes through that ecosystem. Okay, and I'll talk about that. What's another thing we just talked about? Water. Yeah, we want water to infiltrate, and then we want it to be available. That's a huge thing. It's huge, okay? The third thing, we want our soil to filter and buffer out pollutants. We spray, that's good, break it down, bioremediation, caused by the biology. We want to have a physical uh, solid platform. We want to be able to cross the field. We talk about getting stuck in the mud. Didn't you say you're a pivot? Now, that makes sense. Your field is so, I'm, I'm picking on you. Your soil is so degraded that it's plugs, it gets too wet from irrigation and you get stuck in it. And you think about the irony of that. Now, can we overcome that? Yeah, we can. You think about it. Rocky, Brendan Rocky. In the high plains of Nebraska, uh, Colorado, had the same issue, and he gets six inches of rainfall. He's getting stuck in the mud. Anyway, it's because we don't understand how soils function, and it's because we don't consider this. Soil is a habitat. If you remember anything, soil is habitat, and it can be managed, or you are managing it whether you recognize it or not, okay? It's habitat for soil microbes. Let's, let's get into it. The problem is we look at the plant too much. We heard about the... Density of crop, corn, the leaves absorb more energy, that's great. But where does that energy go? It goes down into the ground, and all this kind of biology, all this biomass is being produced. What's biomass? It's just living tissue, whether it's vegetative tissue or whether it's a cow tissue or, or sheep tissue or some or poultry tissue. Okay, that's biomass, okay? And we need to recognize, here's a study that was done in the uh, University of West Virginia, this poor, I always love these studies because I know some poor grad students doing the work, you know, and the, and the PhDs are getting the credit. But anyway, <laughs> he said here he's raising about 600 pounds of, pounds of dairy cow or about 500 pounds of beef cow and about 2,500 pounds of veg, uh, grass above ground. So we got about, what, two, three tons of material there, not much, below ground. Got 2,500 pounds of root mass, 
two, a ton of back, a ton, a ton of bacteria. So small, you got you need an electron microscope to see it. You got two, three tons of fungi. We add all that up. We're talking about biomass below the ground. Four, five, six thousand, or four or five tons. Excuse me, seven, eight, ten thousand pounds. That life, giving life below the ground if we manage it properly. And the key is, we need to quit thinking about soil as this mineral substance of sand, silt, and clay, and start thinking about it as habitat. Now, I had the honor of working in Georgia for about six years, and the first thing I learned over there is all we care about from wildlife is quail. Is that right? Is that the way it is when you cross the line? Everything we do is managed for quail. So how many hunters do we have out there? Got a few. So if you want to build habitat for quail, what do you need to have? You need to provide three things, right? You need to provide water or food, you give them food, you give them water, and you give them a place to live. It's the same thing whether you're managing for quail, a rhinoceros, or a biscuit or mycorrhizal fungi. It's the same thing. You provide those three things, and they will come. You're building habitat. So all you farmers are not tillers of the land anymore. You're managing your subsurface habitat. I want you to get that in your mind. And let's think about it. Everybody familiar with a food web? You know, when I went to college, that was advanced learning. Now they're teaching it in elementary school, so I don't know what that tells me about where I went to college. But the idea, all I know, remember, for college is if you're on the food web, you want to be over here rather than here because your life expectancy is a lot longer over here than it is here. But a food web is really important, and what you're doing is managing the food web in the soil to drive those soil functions I mentioned, such as nutrient management, water cycling, and those things. And let's talk about that. And it's all driven by this. Good presentation this morning about trapping solar energy. We heard something, uh, uh, another one this afternoon about the, the you know, light reflection and how important it is. Everything's driven by the sun, okay? Now, you're going to have to bear with me because I'm going to stretch all of you because I'm going to get into this world of ecology, okay? I mean, I had an ecology course. Come on, raise your hands proudly. That's a, that's a good course. Yeah, that's about what I get there. Most of the time, most of them, because we don't think about connecting it. Ecology is that study of the relationships or that interconnectedness between life, between the plants, the animals, all those living organisms, and it actually swoops down and picks up the subsurface microbes, Okay? It's all being driven by the sun. Sun comes down, photosynthesis, makes plants, plants make roots. Roots put, uh, put two things, they slough off, they put organic matter, they put biomass, they put carbon, they put exudates into the soil, okay? What happens next? Now this, this is one, this is a landscape, anywhere world. This is what we would call a steady state, an ecosystem. Around here, what, if I, pre-European settlers, what would it look like right where I was standing? Would have been a longleaf pine community here? So I did learn something in Georgia, Steve. Longleaf pine and the wire grass. That was the what that meant. That, that was the climax community that was that just established itself, and all those cycles, nutrient cycling, water cycling, all that took place, functioned very well without the input of humans. Okay, but agricultural, we're over here. We're constantly battling nature, aren't we? We're beating it back. What happens to a field if you don't farm it? Nature drives towards complexity. Well, we can learn about that. These systems function well because they have a lot of diversity and they have a minimal amount of disturbance, whereas over here we, we have monocultures, don't we? You raise cotton and you raise peanuts. You know, up in the Midwest we raise corn and we raise soybeans. Well, we might throw in a, a year of wheat just to be diverse, okay? But the point is we don't have much diversity, so it affects our, so our soil. It affects this trapping of the solar energy into the soil, into the roots. These systems tend to be bacterially driven. If you measure the, bio, uh, the bio, uh, biomass in there, they have a lot of different bacteria. That's because we've created that habitat. Remember, we're habitat builders. We've created that habitat for them to thrive. The fungi, those, those, they can't thrive because we're doing things. We're just constantly tilling the soil or putting materials on that to discourage them. Okay, so think about that. Where these systems are just the opposite. They tend to be fungally driven, which, again, we've created a habitat because of the way it's being managed. What we're trying to do is figure out what's in between. Now you think, all right, Lamb, what's this got to do with anything? So what happens? What's the first weed that comes in to a new field that's been not farmed? Well, that was good. Think about it. Generally, it's, what, a small, uh, small uh, seeded grass or something, Palmer amaranth, 
up home it would have been a ragweed or something like that. Those weeds tend to be small seeded. They put most of that energy that they get from the sun and doesn't go into the root. Its purpose is what? I want to survive. I want to come back the next year. So most of the energy that those early successional weeds come in is going into, into the reproduction rather than into the root. Now you think, how, how does that apply? Well, how many of you have been out to UNRCS people and you've talked to a farmer and said, well, there's my cover crop, that hen bit. There are all those winter weeds out there. You think about it. Yeah, have you all heard that? All right, next time you say, yeah, that's a cover out there, but we've changed focus. We're not necessarily only looking at erosion control. We're trying to build and rejuvenate soils. Your, your, your plant is only putting 20% of the energy of the sun into the ground. You're only feeding a very small, limited range of microbes. We're over here, I'm going to design my cover crops. I'm going to co co put cover crop mixes in there that put 40, 50, 60% of that solar energy in there. We're going to jumpstart the ecosystem, the, the successional process, if you will. Think about it. That's really big. You know, I love this quote by this Dr. David Perry. He says, nature moves towards a more complex system, a more diverse system, more productive system, a more resilient system. Disturbance destroys complexity, nature starts it up again. Disturbance, such as fire, such as flood, such as tillage, sends nature back, sends the soil back, and what nature tries to do, build that resilience in there. What's resilience? That's the ability to hold on to water in the middle of the summer when you need it. We can do that. I'll skip that one. All right. Let's think about this in the context of uh, how the food web affects nutrient cycling. Now, the words immobilization and mobilization, does that mean anything to anybody? I know when I checked, that was probably one when I took the multiple guess, I mean choice test on my, uh, in my soil, that was one I stumbled over because I knew I used to think about mobilization is when that nutrient gets tied up in the residue, but I really didn't understand it very well. But really what's going on is, okay, sunlight, plant, root, organic matter gets eaten by bacteria, Fungi are root-feeding nematodes, which that's, we'll talk more about those. They eat that, they incorporate that carbon into their body, and they reproduce and they do their thing, okay? But what happens is you got this protozoa, he's hungry. He goes over there and eats a bacteria. All right, the carbon to nitrogen, everybody understand carbon to nitrogen ratio? Carbon to nitrogen is for every one nitrogen, you got so many carbons. So for a bacteria, for every one nitrogen, he's got five carbons in his body. So a protozoa eats him. His carbon to nitrogen ratio is about 30 to 1, okay? So what's he do when he eats all the bacteria he needs to meet his dietary carbon needs, so to speak? He's eating what? Too much nitrogen. So what happens? He excretes that nitrogen. It's, immo it's mobilized and be put out into the soil solution that right by that rhizosphere, right by that, 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 that uh, root mass in the form it can take up, either uh, NH4 or, or nitrate. It's plant available. That's mineralization. Immobilization is not necessarily tied up in the, in the, in the uh, cells of the plant material, but more it's tied up in the biology, the microbes in the soil. Same thing with a, a nematode and a fungi. Nematodes eat fungi. They have like a, I know it's like a 70 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. A fungi has like a 25 to 1. But see at the point, so we're, what we're doing, we're relying on, on Micro excretement, and I'll use that polite word there, to, that's what mineral, or, uh, provides nutrients to the soil. And we can manage that. All right, that's mineralization. Organic organisms consume each other. Uh, they uh, be, release an inorganic compound. It's taken up either by the plant or it's taken back up by another organism, and then it's stored into the body of the plant. Well, that's different because when we apply fertilizers, when do we do that? We apply it all at once, don't we? Then we apply it in a very mobile form. It's either a nitrate or ammonia, very water soluble in the spring or sometimes in the fall up in the Midwest. But what happens? So that can be moved very easily by water. You, you tie something up in a, a microbe, and if you have a robust, healthy soil, those can be released over time. It's kind of a time release thing. All right, let's think about it in the, in the context of how a food web would help you in the, uh, for pest management. So we got a nematode here. How many like root feeding nematodes? Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, all right. That's, that's, that was a joke, folks. Okay, but we see we got them here. We got a nematode here that's eating these guys. 
But we also have predatory nematodes. Predator-prey relationships are huge. We need that in the soil. We need things to feed on others. So this nematode eats this nematode or this one. And what happens, why do you have predator uh, root-feeding nematodes? It's because you've created the conditions in the soil for them to thrive. They tend to like poorly aerated soils, okay? So what do we do? We till the soil, we destroy the structure, we create micropores, very, and, and aeration is reduced. So we've created a habitat that allows them to outcompete, to flourish. And these poor predators here, what's another thing we might do? Well, by God, we're going to get rid of all those nematodes. All right, so we're going to do, Steve, we're going to spray it with something. Well, we don't have products that just target root feeding nematodes. We got tar products that target nematodes. So they wipe out that whole layer. So in order to have a good, healthy food web, you need to have all layers present. So what happens is those root feeders, you created the conditions for those root feeders to come back. So they respond quicker. They come back quicker where the prey has a little more challenge of it. So you get this balance that's out of whack. Another one here, this is one, I, was, I had the opportunity to go to Hawaii. You know, sometimes you got to suffer for the agency, Steve. So I got to go to Hawaii for two weeks. You know, actually, and it was, it was tough. In the middle of the summer, got to go to four islands, you know. Believe me, it really was tough. But anyway, we were working with a producer there, and we were looking at his soil, and we were looking, you know, smelling it and feeling it and, and, and just doing our basic digging a hole with a shovel out there, uh, Ray and I, and, and, and he is talking about his system, and he said, one of the things he said, he said, you know, I have a, I have a pretty bad nematode problem. Oh, no, no, he said he, had a, he sprayed a fungicide. And we said, well, I bet you got a nematode problem. And we, he said, well, yeah, how'd you know that? And he said, well, because, again, this predator to the prey, this balance of competition for resources, there are fungi right here. This is a nematode. That's a fungi. has a little lasso. That fungi or nematode will swim in there. That fungi will lasso it, choke him down, and then eventually suck his innards out. That's what happens. So the, that's real common. So we did, again, we disrupted that balance in the soil. Again, we created a habitat that was unfavorable by the management systems that we do. I've got to watch this because I hadn't planned on doing this. How much? Well, i got about 10 minutes. Okay. All right, this is man-made soil. Now, why would I say that? I mean, we would like to have soil that look like that, by the way. Yeah, that's pretty good-looking stuff there. Nice, good aggregation. We call that that cottage cheese effect. You got water's going to move down through that. You got nice uh, roots. No sign of compacted layer. You got these uh, uh, nodules that are just, that, that's not popcorn. That, that, that looks, that's a nodules based on, you've got a winter pea or something growing. But the man, the reason I say that is the hand that that, that's attached to the man that made the decisions that influenced this soil. It all is about management. Man's been doing no-till for 30 years, practicing cover crops, uh, you know, using multi-species cover crops when he can, you know, uh, really managing things well to lead to that kind of soil. So that's why I tease about it. It's called man-made soil. And what he's done, he's followed these four basic principles. I want to run through these real quick in the few minutes I have left because if we can get farmers to do this, we can start to build healthy soils that are resilient, that absorb that runoff, and hold on to it till the spring or to the summer when we need it the most. So these are the principles we want to manage more by disturbing less, get diversity, keep a living root growing, and keeping it covered as much as possible. I hit pretty hard on tillage. That's one of the most destructive things we can do because it creates habitat, unfavorable habitat. Again, you're creating habitat, but only certain organisms can live under that, and they tend to be the non-beneficial ones. But tillage, or tillage isn't the only one. We've got physical and chemical. Now, what, why do we till the soil? Anybody want to take a guess? We want weed control, right? We want to prepare a seed bed. We want to do something with that residue from last year. We want to incorporate fertilizer, okay? But if I put this up, you know, why, what does the tillage do to the soil? You know, I read an article. It was in No-Till Farmer magazine over the winter, and they, the guy set forth the idea that maybe we ought to put a label on every piece of tillage equipment like we do on a pack of cigarettes, kind of a warning label. It says, when you use this piece of equipment, it's going to destroy your soil aggregates. 
For some reason, we got the idea about pulling a piece of steel through the ground is going to shove those soil particles together to form soil aggregates. That's not the way it works, folks. You need to have that biological glue. You need to have those bacteria and those fungi in there. That's what builds the aggregates. So you have to create the habitat to allow that to happen. Oh, yeah, by the way, that piece of twillage is going to rapidly decompose all your organic matter because we're going to chop up and slice and dice and we're going to expose it to excessive oxidation. We're going to compact the soil. That's a good thing. Yeah, we know how good that works. You know, so I've worked in an area, well, everybody followed the Lake uh, Toledo Harbor thing or last year about the green algae. You know, they couldn't drink. Well, I, I used to work my county. I was a proud D.C. I helped contribute that, okay? Because we spent so much time trying to prepare soils to no-till through tillage. Now, you think I, and that's, I'm embarrassed to tell you that way. That's pretty. Because we knew there was a compacted layer down there that was restricting root penetration, that was restricting access to all that water and available down in the soil profile. But what we didn't realize is you cannot build aggregates through tillage. It takes... Uh, uh, biological processes. It takes the hyphae of a, of, of, a, uh, of a fungi going out and aligning those soil particles and it's, it's putting out these glues that holds it together. So while we create tillage and compaction through tillage and, man, you know, and excessive heavy equipment, we can only solve it biologically. Until we get that in our heads, we'll never solve that problem. Destroys habitat. So it does all these negative things. Now, so if that was the first thing you used, before you got in your tractor and you read that warning label, maybe you would think twice, well, do I really need to do this trip? Or is there an alternative out there? I mentioned this earlier, soil, for soil, 4.3%, 17 years of monoculture, 1.6%, 60% loss of soil organic matter on this site. But again, that's the average for across the country. We love the till. You know why, my, my, why we like the till? Forgive me, ladies. There is nothing more manly and sitting right there pulling that. Now, come on, guys. Doesn't that just look like something? You see, this thing, can you just see the testosterone dripping off this thing? You know, there's nothing more manly than that, you know? You know? And, and then I go out there and try and convince you you could do the same thing with a tillage radish, you know, wimpy radish. But, oh, by the way, I, I not only break up compaction, I absorb nutrients into, my, into the root fiber. I also put out a little manicide to discourage those non beneficial uh, organisms. Biological disturbance, lack of diversity and rotation. You grazers don't, I thought I saw Eddie around here somewhere. The grazers don't get off. Now, this is not Alabama. I bet there's not one pasture in Alabama that looks like this. <laughs> yeah. Degraded. We, th we give grazers a big pass because there's green. <coughs> green doesn't mean anything when it comes to soil health. You can still have compacted soils. You can still have poor habitat because the, the uncontrolled, by not controlling the hoof and the mouth, of a cow can lead to tremendous soil degradation. This is an equip contract, Steve, from, from Georgia. And this is, again, I point this out because we need to understand how soils function so we can properly re make recommendations to solve problems. You know, Vince, keeping the cow out of the stream, that's a good thing, isn't it? Got these nice uh, heavy use areas around these watering troughs, that's a good thing, isn't it? Nice stream crossing. Degraded pasture. We just wasted $10,000 there because there, there, there is no way that this is going to work. You're still going to get those nutrients run off. You can get as much, if not more, runoff from a pasture like this than you can from a, 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 an eroded crop field. Yeah, if I had more time, I could demonstrate that. But the point is, this is where we should have begun, and then we could do these other practices. We need to learn to manage. And this is simple. This is simple. All you need to do is let the grass grow up and let it, and, and let it rest. It's, it, this is simple to solve. Chemical disturbance can be done by uh, fertilizers, manures, pesticides. We need to keep in mind, and again, I'm not anti-pesticide. I'm not anti-fertilizer. Don't get me wrong, but we need to understand what they do to the soil ecosystem when they're applied. You know, pesticides are nonspecific. They take out everything. So you need to recognize that. So what you do, you have to, all right, if I'm going to, I have this problem, I'm going to treat it, but then I immediately need to mitigate against that impact of that and start to rebuild it. Same thing with fertilizers. You know, they tend to discourage these beneficial relationships, these abiscular mycorrhizal fungi. You know, Steve, it took me about three weeks standing in front of a mirror to be able to say that correctly, you know. But what it is, it's really neat. 80% of the plants that we use for food and fiber production benefit from this relationship, okay? 
So this, this mycorrhiza will infect the root, and then it sends out a hyphae. So it's in the root, sends out this hyphae, it brings in water, it brings in moisture, it brings in uh, zinc, other micronutrients. In exchange, the plant gives it carbohydrates and sugars and proteins to survive. So in essence, what we've done, we've expanded this root mass of this plant exponentially. Instead of touching 2 or 3% of the soil profile, we're up to 7 or 8 or 9% of it. So we're pulling in resources that were previously unavailable. How do we do that? We create that habitat to allow them to thrive. And then manures can you know, do the same thing. All right, this, I already talked about this. How I many is this scary? This is just a no-till uh, Stanley County, North Carolina. I guess the point is managing heavy, heavy cover crops can be done. They're forgiving soils and they're easier to plan to. Second principle, getting diversity. This, is, this was really an eye-opener for me because do you realize that every plant puts juices into the soil, exudates into the soil? I didn't realize that. Now, this, is your, this is your class assignment. Next spring, you go out and plant your corn, whether it's in your sweet, gar sweet corn in your garden or whether it's your neighbor's corn, field of corn. You go out there when it's about this tall. You pluck out that corn plant, you wipe off the root a little bit, and you bite into that. And that's going to be like biting into a sugar cube. That plant is generating sugars and carbohydrates, and it's attracting a realm of biology. It's stimulating bacteria and fungi, and it's got this specific range. Now, you do that at the end of the summer, and it's not going to be such a pleasant experience, okay, because the plant isn't as actively growing. It doesn't need to stimulate that biology because it's on the downside of its life cycle. Okay, so that's really important, but the more every plant does that, so the more diversity of plants you have, the more um, exudates you have, the more diversity you have as far, when it comes to micros. I was reading a paper the other day, it said a typical corn or uh, uh, cropland field will have anywhere from uh, two to 3,000 different species of bacteria, okay? A typical, uh, like a forest, <laughs> or a, a, a long grass prairie, something like that, will have 25 or 30,000 different species. So when you have that much more diversity, you have a, a much more resilient system that's going to be providing those benefits throughout the growing season. This is kind of gives, give you an example that not all plants are, uh, are the same. This is a different uh, exudates and nitrogen concentration. Look at a white clover. It's got a lot of uh, um, nitrate in it compared to the lupin. Again, just to kind of show you that not everything, all plants are the same. And think about here, we need to think about the more diversity we have above ground, the more diversity we'll have below ground. How do we do that now? How many farmers have we got in here? A couple of you now. One way to do that is by adding perennial grasses at the end of the rotel. How many are ready to start getting in the haymaking business? No, we're not going to do that. Now, that's a good way to do it. Don't get me wrong. That is an excellent way to do it by adding lengthening the rotation, uh, putting uh, you know, uh, perennials in there. But really what we need to do is think about adding more plants in the rotation. In these, so how are we going to do that? Through cover crops. Through cover crops. Now, how do we judge whether cover crop is successful or not? By how much it grows above the ground, right? But you think about it, here we've got a soil that has not seen the exudates from a cover crop mix that's got crimson clover and hairy vetch and maybe some radishes in, in forever. So maybe those radishes only grow six, eight, ten weeks. They're still, you ever think, most plant development is below ground, the first part of it. It's putting those exudates, it's growing dynamically. So maybe we need to rethink our success and think, well, maybe if that's only there for a while, six, eight, ten weeks, we ought, we ought to be able to... Uh, 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 get some benefit out of that. And again, you need to think about getting diversity. You need to add, make sure you get plants representing different groups. What we've done is tried to break it down simple. You know, you got warm season grasses, warm season broadleaves, cool season grasses, cool season broadleaves. Make sure your rotation includes that. And if it doesn't, then use cover crops that fall into that. What am I talking about? This is what the warm season grasses are. Warm season broadleaves. I'm kind of hurrying here because I want to get to something. Ray Steyer, that's Ray's soil right there. Yeah, anyway, that's, that's what they look like. But what we need to do is think about mimicking nature. If you would go out into a prairie and look and measure some square unit, you would find 50, 20, 25 different plant species, and you got all this diversity, all these exudates going in there at different times through the growing season. Same thing for a forest. 
some work done by uh, Dr. Tillman up in Minnesota shows that, you know, once you get about seven or eight different species growing, you, you produce more biomass than a monoculture. And the same thing in more functional groups, the cool season, the warm season, the broadleaves, and, and so forth. The more of those that are represented in your rotation, again, more biomass is being produced. Some work done out of the University of Michigan shows that, what's that do on the biology? Well, the more species, the more biology. They weighed, uh, using a phospho, uh, phospholipid fatty acid test, they just me measured the uh, biology in the soil, and it came up. And then it also talks about respiration. The more biology, the more energy, and the more work being done, okay? Diversity, diversity, diversity. Oops, what did I do here? I hit a button. Uh, there you go. I, I, one, one more point and I'll shut up here. All right, let me go here. Root mass. This one is a no-brainer, folks. We need to learn how to keep a living root growing year-round, <coughs> as long as possible. Why? Because you got that much more exudates, that much more biology, that much more uh, uh, bio, uh, carbon being put into the soil. This is some uh, work which shows, here's a corn plant, plant it, grow it about 110 days, produces about 900 to 1,000 pounds of biomass, root mass, in that top four or five inches, okay? Cotton down here, soybeans, about half of that. Here we got a, a cover crop we plant at that time of the year when you're not even using the field. You put in a hairy vetch, cereal rye, crimson clover mix, something like that. In that top four or five inches, you can produce almost over a ton of root mass. This is based on Russell data out of... Uh, 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 North Carolina. But my point is, we're putting all this plant roots, all these exudates, feeding all this biology in a time of the year when you're at the coffee shop. You think about that. How do we do that? We need to hurry up and get that done. I want to show this. Two more slides here. I sound like Ray here. How are we going to get that done? This is way too many slides. All right. We can fly it on. You guys familiar with that? That's good. You can fly it on. Nice cover. You got to watch your seeding rates. This is some work done out of Penn State. They're going in at lay-by time, putting nitrogen on, and he's putting his cover crop. See, that's what it looks like. You know, here's another one. High boy cedar. This is what we're talking about, Wade. They're going in, and they're going down between rows of corn. These things drop down between the corn, and they're seeding the cover crop. That's what it looks like going through the field. That corn's mature. It's not, you know, we saw from your, uh, your, your work, Dr. Orth, to tease that, you know, the, the plant shuts down. We're not using that moisture. It goes in there at harvest. We're doing this at, at the end of, well, you know, whenever, end of August, 1st of September down here. It might be a little later. Here's one, y'all, that would be real applicable for Alabama. That's cotton, right? I, I want to make sure you recognize that. See, he's defoliating his cotton. He's putting a, co a cover crop on at that time. And this is what it looks like. Never used it again because his popper wasn't big enough. So actually, he's doing that process. He's just using a different thing. But my point is, once farmers, we can get fence farmers, this is a good idea. They'll come up with their own. This is one, this guy, these are lawnmower blades. He decided to whack the top out of his corn at the end of the cropping season because he could get that three or four week jump on things. Now, he didn't get OSHA approval on that one. But, but again, but my point is, once you convince a farmer it's a good idea, they'll make it work, okay? And then with that, I'm going to be quiet. Anybody have any questions real quick? Hey, here's the question over here. Yeah. When you put that cover crop out, when you're at the lay-by, it like you were at the B10 or whatever, how are you going to get enough sun down there to keep that crop alive when that, when what we talked about is trying to shake that stuff out and not be gross? How does that work? Well, you need to, one, you need to pick the right cover crop, the right cultivars. And, it, and, and, you know, you use something like, I think they were using just some cereal rye. The basic, what happens, it just kind of goes, you know, pop up and grow, and it almost hit like a, a I don't hate to use the word dormancy, but it just it won't grow very much. And then when you cut the top out of it, it'll release and let that some kind of sunlight come back in there. And then a lot of times, that you know, corn will lose its leaves and stuff throughout the year, too. So, again, it's just an idea out there, but it's being, I think you're going to hear more about intercropping systems like that, growing next year's crop and while well, this one's growing, especially with cover crops, because what you gain, and I can't remember who showed that information, maybe it was Dr. Thompson over here, that about the earlier growth or something, the, the earlier you plant it, the more biomass you get, 
I mean, that's huge, you know. You're gaining three or four weeks in the fall, you know, you can really gain a lot of biomass there, so. Hairy vetch will pr crank out some nitrogen. You know, I know people are concerned about hard seed. You know, and you think about it, the problem with cover crops is we're just using what's been given to us. We have not, you know, look about, again, we go back to the presentation on the corn varieties and how much we've improved varieties and how better they are because genetics has been used to improve them. We have not done that with cover crops. We have not tried to breed cover crops to do specific things. And I, I really think that's the next generation of trying to find a, a hairy vetch that doesn't have such a hard seed. I mean, there's tons of seed up around that's old seed that just didn't maybe necessarily produce as much whatever that they were desirable, but may have had that characteristic. So I think that's the next wave of, of development in that type of thing. Dr. Lamb, do you have a website where you see more of this great information? Uh, yeah, one thing, I'm, I'm just an old BSer. <laughs> Don't <laughs> That's pretty much my, I, I was happy to get out of there. I appreciate the, 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 uh, the, the comment there. But, but yeah, if you go to the NRCS's national website and you go to a call to, and you'll see a thing called Unlock the Secret of the Soil, and there's a whole array of things. There's a lot of videos. You know, we, we went through and hired somebody and went out and interviewed like 18 researchers from around the country and did some really nice videos for us about explaining, you know, in three minutes some of the concepts that we're talking about, and they're really, they're really good, so. But with that, I'll give you this. All right. Thank you.